Hey folks, what's up? Lex here, and today I'm going to be giving you 10 beginner tips for Tactics Ogre Reborn, a remake of one of the most renowned tactical RPGs ever made. Let me tell you up front that I am no expert on this game. There are other channels out there that have meticulously broken down the systems and mechanics in this game that can better tell you about the granular stuff to look out for. This video is for those who are newer to the tactics genre and are maybe curious about picking up the game, but possibly intimidated by diving in. So here we go. Number one, don't fret about permadeath. Yeah, this is the elephant in the room, isn't it? You're like, Tactics Ogre has permadeath. I'm out. It's the number one thing I've heard from people as to why they're not picking this game up. But I'm here to tell you that permadeath in Tactics Ogre Reborn is not that bad. Really, it's possibly the most lenient permadeath system I've ever played. Certainly more lenient than Fire Emblem or XCOM. And that boils down to just how much time you have to revive your fallen allies. You see, once your character hits 0 HP, they don't just suffer permadeath right then and there. Once they hit the floor, you'll see a countdown pop up above their head. The countdown will start at 3 and very slowly tick down from there you'll have essentially three full team turns to revive them before they're lost forever. This is plenty of time to get to them and use a reviving item. In fact, it's such a long time that I usually leave them down for a while before I worry about it. Yes, they're better to you conscious than unconscious, but it might not be worth it to compromise your position just to run to their aid, only for them to get knocked out again a few turns later. I know permadeath isn't a system that suits everyone's personality, I know it can cause more stress than it's worth, but I think permadeath is a cool feature that adds weight to every move you make on the battlefield. In my 30 hours played so far, I've only lost one character, and I'd have to think really hard to even remember who they were. You can have so many characters in your army that it's always next character up. Really, there's no need to be afraid of permadeath in this version. Number two, positioning matters. Positioning is everything in Tactics Ogre. It'll often be the difference between getting by by the skin of your teeth and decidedly winning a battle. Archers, for example, are best positioned away from the front lines as they can do the most damage from afar. Get them to higher position points if possible as this will often help with spreading their attack range but it's not enough to just put your archers on higher ground. It's important to understand damage types too. For example, an archer will do a lot of damage to a magic user in light armor, but the damage will be negligible if that archer takes a shot at a heavy armored knight. Scouting the battlefield before a fight is key, as you not only get to see which units you're about to take on, but you'll be able to see the map and how you might be able to play it. The maps in Tactics Ogre are varied. Some will be very vertical, some narrow, some wide, some will give you the advantage, and some will give the advantage to the enemy. Think of Tactics Ogre like a board game. Take your time to plan out a strategy that will give you the advantage, or at the very least, take the advantage away from the enemy. Number three, take the time to make sure your unit is properly stocked and kitted. When it comes to success on the battlefield, you'll need every advantage you can get, you may be tempted to hop from one battle to the next without doing the proper maintenance on your squad, but stop. Take the time to take inventory on which items you've equipped, who you have them equipped to, and if there's anything you can do to optimize your squad. This could be anything from making sure your damage tank has more healing items equipped than your other units, to crafting better versions of your weapons and armor once you unlock crafting later in the game. A good amount of your time should be spent in these menus, prepping for your next fight. The old adage, better to be safe than sorry, holds a lot of weight here. Getting loot is great, but what good is it if you don't take the time to properly equip it? This also applies to the shop, where you'll need to visit to sell your Obereth for Goth, the currency of Tactics Ogre, and restock on items used in battle. Be good to your units, and they should be good to you. Number four, don't go crazy building out your army. Remember this, just because you can recruit 100 characters doesn't mean you have to or even that you should. 
In fact, buying and recruiting characters just because will only muddy up your menus and can have you feeling overwhelmed in no time. Instead, it might be better to keep a smaller army of 20 to 25 characters, that way you can spend more time tailoring each of them to be the best fighter they can be. That's not to say you shouldn't recruit at all, as recruiting can bring characters with new classes and abilities that can really give you an advantage in later battles. In fact, if you have a great chance at recruiting someone, and you're not going to end up dead just because you chose to roll a recruiting chance instead of kill the enemy, then do so. Even if it's a class you already have, you can then change their class with a class mark and breathe new life into the fighter. But if you're just compromising your whole team to recruit enemy soldier units that you can easily buy in the shop and that you can easily level by training, then you need to ask yourself this simple question, why? Oftentimes the answer is just because you can. I get that, I feel it too. But if you want to be successful your first time through, maybe narrow your focus a bit and curate a small, strong, capable army instead. Number five, train. A lot of the grinding has been taken out of this version of Tactics Ogre, and it's all mitigated by your union level, which is essentially a scaling level cap that increases as you advance in the story. What this means is that once a character hits the level of the union level, that character can no longer earn experience until the union level rises. What the game does with leftover experience is puts it into a charm that you can then use on an underleveled unit without bringing them into battle. This does not, however, take out all the need to grind. In order for your character's skills to increase, they must use them in battle. This is where training comes in. In between story battles, the game allows you to train your fighters to gain experience points and increase their skills. The good news is that there is no permadeath during training battles. When a character is knocked down to 0 HP, they'll just teleport off the map and you get to keep them. The bad thing about training is that there's no loot. Loot can only be found in story battles. So you'll mainly benefit from the experience gain and skill progression in training. There is, however, another benefit that is far less tangible, and that's your battle experience as a player. Training is a great opportunity to test out new formations, new attack combos, and really get a good feel for the abilities of your army. Training is a super valuable tool that should be seen as much more than gains for your stats. Remember, good strategy can often make up for over-muscled enemies, but bad strategy will often get you killed even if your units are up to the challenge. Number six, loot and cards. Loot is great. Loot is wonderful. Loot in this game is going to get you the edge that you need to overcome a lot of battles. It's where you're going to get some of the best items in the game, and even when you eventually unlock crafting to buff those items, loot at the very least will take some of the burden off of having to buy some crafting ingredients. Loot can also get you into a lot of trouble. The siren song of sweet loot will often take you off track from your game plan and make you paranoid that the enemies are going to steal what you just earned. When an enemy is defeated, they'll often drop a bag of loot, and that loot will stay on the battlefield until it's claimed. If you claim it, you get the spoils. If the enemy claims it, they get those spoils. If the battle ends with you winning and the bag unclaimed, you will get the loot. This is an important note. You don't need to move your characters to the bag to get the rewards. You just have to keep enemies away from them. And most of the time, enemies will only get the loot if they're coming at you and the bag is in front of a character or if it's in their path. So while you'll want to earn all the loot you can, you can easily be blinded by the treasures, putting you in a slight disadvantage in battle. Also scattered around the battlefield will be these floating cards. Cards and Tactics Ogre give you some important buffs and some unwanted debuffs, and they're generated randomly throughout the map, making each battle dynamic. The blue cards will give you buffs like a better chance to trigger a passive skill, temporarily buffing your physical stats, and giving you a guaranteed critical hit on your next attack. Blue cards only have an effect for that battle and do not affect your characters outside of that battle. Green cards, however, offer permanent stat boosts 
for whichever character captures them. These are pretty rare, especially early on, so don't count on these as a reliable source to beef up your army. Lastly, there are red cards, which take away all buffs you've received from the blue cards in that particular battle. You can knock your enemies into these cards, but they can also knock you into them as well, so tread carefully. Number 7. Don't worry about killing every unit. I still do this all the time. I know better, but I can't help but go into kill em all mode when I see a map full of enemies. And sometimes that will be your objective, but most of the time your objective will be to take out a single target. Don't get me wrong, taking out as many enemies as you can is a good thing, as they'll often drop valuable loot that you can't buy in the shop, or at worst, stuff you can sell for goth. However, if you're getting your butt kicked, and you have several characters on the cusp of permadeath, and your odds are spiraling, then it's time to switch your focus from the loot to the main objective. Even if you see an enemy with low HP who is not the main objective, Wasting a turn to take them out instead of focusing your attack on the main objective could be a costly move. Number 8. Go with the flow. This is an important one to me. So many times I see people trying to look up guides on where to get this and how to build an unstoppable character. I get it. You want to get it right the first time. Nobody enjoys losing. And if you can put yourself at an advantage, then you're probably going to take it. But I implore you, for your first playthrough at least, just go with the flow. The game starts you out with a Q&A using tarot cards, and your answers to these questions will affect the base stats of your main character, Denim. You might be enticed to look up a guide so that you get the stats that you want, but I would recommend roleplaying here. Get a good idea in your mind of what kind of fighter you want Denim to be and answer the questions accordingly. Want Denim to be a good physical attacker? Maybe you answer like a meathead brute. Want Denim to be a long-ranged attacker? Maybe you answer the questions with some tact. This goes for the rest of the game, too. Be okay with permadeath. Be okay with losing a character or two. Be okay with a character laying unconscious. Be okay with the dice rolls. Be okay with the decisions you make in the story. Enjoy the game walking the tightrope and then come back through old saves and see what changes when you answer differently. But for your first playthrough, relax and just see where the journey takes you. You may lose a beloved character to permadeath, but maybe you replace them with a character that turns out to be even better. Maybe you'll become a better tactician because you don't want to lose anyone else. Or maybe no character will ever be as good as the one you lost, and you'll remember them forever. Either way, you'll be okay, and the dynamics of what could have been will make playing Tactics Ogre a rewarding experience. Number 9. The Warren Report is your friend. The Warren Report, not the Warren Commission, acts as your in-game strategy guide. While it won't tell you how to approach individual battles like a normal strategy guide might, it will tell you valuable information about the mechanics of Tactics Ogre and give you a base understanding of these systems. There's a lot of text to read through here, but I think it's worth it. You'll also get story info that makes for a richer experience. I know taking an hour to read through a bunch of instruction is not necessarily fun, but Tactics Ogre has a lot of moving parts, and it's best to at least have a base knowledge before you go seeking out a more advanced understanding of them. The Warren Report also offers stats, recaps, and titles that you've earned for your army through the choices that you've made. It's a really handy guide, so use it. And finally, number 10, save often. Please, save often, and make new saves every time you do. You're gonna wanna come back once you're done with your first playthrough and make different choices, and having many saves to choose from will make things much easier. I usually save after every battle and after every story cutscene when I can. And each time I do, I make a new save. It's simple, and it will give you a good reason to come back after your initial playthrough. So, that does it for my 10 tips for people who are new to Tactics Ogre. I hope this helped you out and has you ready to take on this fantastic tactical RPG. 
Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more intermediate tips, and if you're already playing Tactics Ogre, let me know what you think of the game. Until next time, this is Lex, signing off.